All right. So uh, welcome, everyone. Appreciate you making time in your day today to join us. Our topic today is email marketing for beginners. This is a very basic um, get you started with the assumption you know nothing. And that's fair because a lot of people just hear about things that they should be doing, but they don't necessarily have all the information or have had the time or, or guts to go ahead and actually dip your toe in the water and like get started. So that's our objective today is to give you information you need so that way you can go and get started. And then you can make your own decisions how you want to proceed from there. This webinar is recorded and if you want a copy of it, we'll tell you at the end how to get it. Um, so you don't have to go and write in the, in the chat, is this being recorded? <laughs> and there are no handouts because we're recording the webinar. Um, but I do suggest, you know, spend some time listening, taking notes, and obviously submitting questions if you can. So who am I? My name is Roland Reinhardt. I'm a digital marketing consultant. For the last 30 plus years, I've been in marketing and advertising. I have worked with big brands all the way down to mom and pops and rolled up my sleeve and do everything. I do strategy. I do tactical. Um, a lot of digital. Um, so I can talk about all these topics day and night, and I don't want to bore your, your ears out. <laughs> I'm going to go and just give you information that I think is going to be easy to implement and repeatable, and that way you can sort of have some success with it. Uh, I am also a small business owner, so I know what it's like to wear many hats every day. I've been doing that for a dozen years. I've been a business consultant with the Small Business Development Center in New Jersey for 11 years now. So I work one-on-one -on -one with businesses like yourself to go and try to help demystify digital marketing topics. Um, I've also, you know, um, been training in teaching like various forms of these classes for all that time too. So feel free to pick my brains, but today I'm going to say that we're going to have to stay focused on email marketing. Um, so you can thank the Small Business Development Center for making this webinar available. I mean, in this difficult time right now, we've tried to go and put out many different webinars over the past three months um, to try to sort of fill that void because we realize a lot of people have been displaced. They're working from home. Um, so, you know, this is a perfect opportunity to try to sort of work on things in your business rather than on your business or, or work on your business rather than in your business. Um, but, you know, it's now's the time to take advantage of these tools and resources. And if you didn't know about them, definitely you should check them out. If you live in Somerset or Huntington County, check out the SBDC at Red Valley Community College. If you live in Monmouth or Ocean County, um, communicate with the folks at uh, SBDC at Brookdale Community College. These are all really, really helpful, friendly people, and they want to help you get you answers, move you further down. You don't have to suffer in silence. If you don't know something, raise your hand and ask. Um, there's phone numbers and domain names on the screen. If you want to schedule one-on-one -on -one business counseling, visit either website and just look for the link that says request free or no cost business counseling. Um, and then you can just follow the instructions to go and submit and request and they'll match you up one-on-one -on -one with an expert on some topic. I focus on a lot of digital marketing topics, but there's other experts that will answer questions on, you know, business planning, QuickBooks, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You just have to sort of ask explain what your need is and then they'll match you up. We're not doing the work for you. We're helping giving you information and there's no charge for these services. So take advantage of it and please tell a friend. Um, so what are you gonna need today? Take some notes, as I said, um, try to engage. I will try to keep you from falling asleep. <laughs> um, ask questions where you can. Um, and again, you know, this is gonna be recorded, so don't worry, we'll give you that information at the end. Um, to do email marketing well, you should have a website because you need to drive people to some destination. Just sending out emails isn't necessarily the end of it. You know, you have a website and that should be the destination where you can control all the information about who you are, what you do. Um, you are going to learn today a few repeatable steps. And we're going to use MailChimp as the platform. MailChimp is one of many um, do-it-yourself email marketing service providers out there. It's very simple. It's become a lot less complicated over many years of development. Um, it's much like many other service providers that are out there, you know, Constant Contact, Aweber. I mean, there's, there's no end to them. I'm not going to talk about all those other services because it's just not enough time. Um, so we will focus on MailChimp and we'll go through some very specific steps, how you can go and get started for the first time and hopefully avoid some mistakes that are you know, will we'll sort of derail your efforts. Um, and again, just to be mindful here, um, as a disclaimer, we do not have any affiliation with MailChimp. We just pick them as a service provider that we know that provides free uh, solution for, for small businesses like yourself until you grow to a certain point. So you can do your own research and figure out what provider is right for you. Um, this is not an endorsement. We are just giving you information. So you do with it what you want. 
Um, we're not going to talk about those other service providers because it's just not enough time. We're not going to talk about advanced topics in email marketing like list buying and audience segmentation, et cetera, et cetera. There's just not enough time and it's just going to derail our, our conversation. So what do we need to think about? Email marketing is, you know, just another tactic in the consumer journey, right? People are, have to find out about you somehow, and supposedly you got their email address, you put them on a list, hopefully you did that in a correct way, and we'll discuss that in a little while. You're going to send emails out on some regular basis, explaining, you know, who you are, what you do, and providing uh, details about your products or services, and giving them ways of connecting with you, purchasing, learning more, etc. Those emails are going to get delivered to the recipient on their smartphone, their tablet, their desktop, their laptop. It doesn't matter. Um, these services work really well to get put a message in an inbox. And then they're going to click on something, right? They're going to open the email. They're going to click on some link in there, a registration link, a link to a blog post, whatever it is. They're going to come back to a page of your website, you know, typically some kind of web web landing page, we might call it, and hopefully they're going to take some action from there. Maybe they're going to sign up for a webinar, maybe they're going to download a PDF, maybe they're going to watch a video that you put on there. It's whatever you want. This is up to you to decide what these things are going to be, because ultimately it wraps up into overall, what are you trying to do with your prospect or customer? With prospects, you typically are doing some kind of lead nurturing and trying to push them further down the line to trust you, feel that you're a subject matter expert, you're authoritative, and then eventually hire you for something or buy something from you, or maybe even refer you to someone else, right? If they're a customer, then maybe you're trying to go and do loyalty and retention type efforts, trying to constantly keep them engaged, remembering who you are, what you do, and uh, you know maybe giving people different ways to think about how to use the services that they've already acquired from you. So email marketing, should you do it, should you do, shouldn't you do it? I mean, there's pros and cons to everything. I mean, it is technically relatively easy to get started. You could just create a free account put together an email list, um, put together a message, send it out on some kind of frequency, and then you know use some reporting to go and figure out, are you being successful at getting your emails delivered? Are you getting your emails opened? Are you getting links clicked? The negative to this is that you, know, you constantly have to create relevant content. It's like anything else. If you're actively engaged in social media, you're generating regular content. If you're creating YouTube videos, you're creating regular content. So it just becomes another activity that you need to to set time aside for and plan and think about. You know, you always want to be proactive about this stuff and sort of work off of a plan. Oftentimes we, we do things like an editorial calendar where we try to sketch out like the next 12 to, to 18 months of the year. What are the seasonality issues? What are the things that come up each month? What are the things that we need to push to hit, meet certain goals throughout a year? And maybe that's the way you should think about all this stuff too. So you're not just sitting down at a computer and like, what am I gonna write today? It's if you're working off of some kind of calendar or plan, you could be deciding okay, for the month of July, these are the most important things, and I should be doing messages maybe on a weekly basis or twice a month. Um, I need to tie these into certain social media posts that I'm doing, whatever. You know, you have to figure that out for yourself, and if you don't know what an editorial calendar is, go to Google and type example of an editorial calendar, and you'll find lots of great re references there. So, um, while you're constantly creating content, and it can become enjoyable if you get used to it and good at it and you're seeing good results, you have to be careful that you follow the rules because sending email and getting messages into an inbox, you know, that sounds great and easy and it technically is very, very cheap to do, but it can also get people upset because they feel like they're spamming you or they didn't, you didn't, they didn't give you the authority to be sending them messages if they can't remember how they know you or such. So there's things that you have to be careful about and I will talk about those in a few minutes. You also be, have to be mindful that whatever mailing list you're using can become stale over time. And by that I mean if you're s waiting months and months before sending each email, people forget who you are. Um, people change their email addresses. They might be using their business email address and then they left that business and now that's a dead email. So you know you don't you want to get people hopefully to provide you with you know email addresses that that will be sort of like coming with them over time or like their personal addresses than their business addresses. But there's no, you know, proper way to do that. It's just a matter of like if you're messaging people on a regular basis, they're going to make sure that they have a method of following you, whether it's email or social. So what are the best steps to do? I mean, you need to create an audience or an email list, right? And that's going to be very simple. It's a little spreadsheet or so, and I'll show you how to do that. 
you can log into your MailChimp account and choose a template. So a template's gonna help you with the very first time to sort of put structure to what you're going to do. So you're not just sort of guessing, you don't have to have any programming skills. You have to create content to put into that template, so that's kind of easy. You know, it's basically a subject line, a headline, a, some body text, a link to something, maybe an image. You need to test everything before you send it to your list because it would be really embarrassing to send something that looks crappy to a whole bunch of people, and then those people are all going to unsubscribe immediately. <laughs> um, and then, you know, once you're satisfied with testing, you actually send it out and then sort of step back and measure results. And usually we see results within the first, you know, 24 to 48 hours. That's where the majority of emails will get opened. And you can figure out, okay, did you get a high deliverability rate? Did you have a whole bunch of emails that bounced back as undeliverable for some technical reason? Were a, a large number flagged as spam by the recipients? You know, um, did you get opens? You know, did you get clicks on the links that were in those things? So those are the things that are going to sort of help you on that first time that you're sending and sort of like help you to adjust your expectations for the next time. Yeah. Oops. So list preparation. Um, I like to just put together a simple spreadsheet. It doesn't matter what you do it in, Excel, uh, Google Sheets, whatever you want, uh, numbers on the Mac. It's just basically columns and rows. Think of each row as a unique person, and then maybe three columns minimum. You know, one column is the email address, one column is the first name, one column is the last name. And you can add any more columns on there if you want to do other things to help you um, identify things for yourself. But I don't need to go and have phone numbers, street addresses, things like that. You know, the minimum I need typically is like, you know, their name, their email, and maybe if I feel like it's optional, you know, I have some column to, to identify what the relationship with this person is. And as I said, each row is a unique person. You don't go and uh, say, uh, you know, the email address and then the first name is, or have like multiple emails for, for the same person. You know, that's kind of irritating, right? So you just want to try to go and like capture one per person, figure out what the primary email address is, and then use that. Um, you want to, technically, you want to have permission to send an email. Now, in the spirit of the law, there is something called can spam, which was um, a, uh, whoops, a federal guideline uh, put, put out a number of years ago to go and try to prevent marketers from abusing the uh, sending out messages to people. Um, so there is technically legal guidelines that you should only be sending emails to people that have either requested information from you or that you have a transactional relationship with. So yeah, if you went through your LinkedIn account and you saw all these people that you've connected to over time, you technically have had communicated or know each other somehow, that's probably fine to take those email addresses and put them in your list for the first time. What is not fine is if you go to the Chamber of Commerce website and start scraping and copying email addresses of people and businesses that you don't know and dropping that into your mailing list or getting it from other sources um, that, ha that you know, are questionable like that. That is going to get you in trouble. Now, you are a small fry in a big universe. It's quite possible that you'll never get pestered uh, or harassed about that. But... Um, you don't want to go and do anything that's going to run afoul. Because the other thing is, if people don't recognize you when they're receiving an email from you, they're likely to go and click the unsubscribe and probably I'd flag it as spam. And if you get many people flagging you as spam, then the email service provider, in this case MailChimp, is going to make note of that. The email recipient service is going to make note of that. And it's going to become harder for you to get your messages delivered directly to the inbox without sort of getting shunted into a junk mail or spam folder. So it's always better just be on the up and up. Try to keep this legitimate people that you know. That way the quality of the list is higher because they should recognize you. There should be very few less likely to go and like unsubscribe. And then you should have better success over time. Um, so uh, let's see. Next. After you have your list together in a little spreadsheet, like I mentioned, I'm sorry, I got dogs that just keep <laughs> entering my office here. I got two dogs that just keep coming over looking for treats. Um, so next step is content preparation. Uh, you should keep things simple. You don't have to go and make big, long dissertation with, you know, five, ten paragraphs of text and big, long thing. Because the reality is we all know everybody's attention span is limited. Yes, some people will read every word on the page. Many people will only sort of skim and probably read nothing 
or very little. And then you, so it's up to you to try to figure out how do you find the right balance for your audience and make it interesting enough and compelling that they want to click on the subject line or uh, because that's going to encourage them to open it up. They're going to actually read a little bit, hopefully take whatever call to action that you're defining, and then hopefully take whatever step is beyond that. So, you know, you have to come up with the content. I like to typically do emails, maybe no more than two topics. You know, there's like an A and a B. A is probably the primary, most important thing. B is sort of like secondary. Um, and each one, you know, sort of has weight on its own. Maybe it has an image, has an interesting headline, has maybe one or two paragraphs of text. And each one will probably have a link clicking through to some page on a website that specifically continues explaining what that is or has more specific call to action information on it. It's up to you. There's no right or wrong. I'm just giving you the things that help having better success. Test prep. So you put an email together, you chose a template, you wrote the content, you got to go and send a test to yourself. You know, the, these tools like MailChimp will have sort of an on-screen preview so you can see what it looks like in its full blown out version. They'll have like a, a way of seeing what it looks like on a narrow smartphone. You should still send a test email specifically to you. Ideally, sometimes, you know, if we want to be a little bit more aggressive with our testing, we'll send emails to different service provider accounts that we control. So one to a Gmail, one to a Yahoo, one to an Outlook. Um, you know, in the old days, we used to do all the other stuff too, you know, the Hotmail, the MSN, AOL, all that stuff, opt online. Um, it's up to you to decide how far you want to go. Nowadays, email service providers in general are a lot better and a lot more forgiving of, um, not of, of rendering emails properly, but, you know, the point of testing is to make sure that you sort of cover the lowest common denominator, that the most common email providers that people are using, they all seem to be rendering your email in an efficient way. And if you're using a template that comes from like MailChimp or any of these other providers, they usually will have temp templates that they've already pre-designed and tested that work well in all these service providers. But, you know, for your own confidence, it's usually a good idea to check for yourself because there are weird things that happen from time to time. Excuse me. Um, and of course, you know, if you do any kind of personalization, which is a little bit more of an advanced thing, but if you had something like, you know, Dear John at the big, that automatically gets slugged into the body of the email, you want to go and send a test to make sure that that's actually working. And just make sure your list makes sense based on what I said before. Um, go ahead and, uh, you know, send messages to people you know. Always provide people with a method of opting out. Again, a template that you choose with a service like MailChimp is going to give you methods that like there's usually like an unsubscribe function at the bottom of every page. Thank you, everybody who's sending me that message. Um, there, so, you know, usually two methods are required, but, you know, if you use an unsubscribe or people reply with the word unsubscribe in the subject line, usually the system will go and take care of things automatically. But, you know, that's an important consideration. Um, also, you know, you should go and make sure you're not you know, uh, doing anything that sort of implies um, any deceptive type of methods. Like, uh, so for example, you know, if you are selling something, you know, be upfront and clear about what it is that you're selling. Don't try to obfuscate that. Um, you don't want, to, you also have a, an obligation to go and provide a physical real world address in the footer of your email. And, you know, again, MailChimp and any other service provider, they give you that information on how to put that in there. So I realize a lot of people are like, well, I don't want to put my home address if you work at home. Um, if you have a PO box, you could usually do something like that and get away with it. Um, but don't, don't lie about these things. I mean, try to figure out what the right solution is um, just to respect and check off the box of as many things as possible and make sure you're complying to the best of your ability. Also, you know, with any content you use, whether it's images or from other sources, please don't steal. I mean, just because you can Google it and discover it on Google doesn't mean it's, you have a right to just use it and repeat it for your own purposes, especially for commercial purposes. We can talk about that a little bit later, but, you know, there are sources online where you can get images to use for free, and, and you, I'll show you one of those sites in a little while so you can figure that out. But don't steal stuff. Um, don't just assume you have a right to use it. You know, try to find a source that's reputable that allows you to use it and then sort of document that information for yourself. So that way, if anybody comes back in the future trying to, uh, to say that you didn't have the right to use something, you can absolutely, you know, with confidence declare you did. So with that said, let's go ahead and create your first campaign. Um, I'll show you a couple of steps on, uh, on the, the screen here, and then I'll jump into a live demonstration. This is just easier just to sort of get things started. So 
when you create a uh, MailChimp account for the first time, you'll see a couple of screens. They'll tell you to do a few things. And then, um, you know, you'll get in there. You know, and they'll probably the first few things they'll do is they'll, they'll ask you to make sure you have your business information, your mailing address information, phone number, website link. So they're going to dynamically populate some of that stuff into the templates for you. And then once you've finished all of that, whatever validation steps that they want you to take, then you'll have a dashboard. And, you know, a dashboard like this, after you've submitted and sent out a couple of campaigns over time, you know, you'll have something like looks sim simple. You'll know what the past campaigns you sent. It'll have some of the basic statistics. You can always drill into a report to see much more specific granular detail. But, you know, this is what you're going to see. Um, the first place to start is the audience. So in that navigation at the top, we click on audience. We want to go and upload an audience or import an audience for the first time. So if you did that step I showed you earlier, you created a spreadsheet, three columns minimum, email address, first name, last name, each row being um, a unique uh, person that you're sending to, then you go ahead and import that. Um, I don't like to do anything where they're integrating into some existing service. Like I don't want anybody going into my CRM or my address book or whatever, or my Google Docs. Um, I just go ahead and sort of copy paste things in manually. That's just me because I don't want too many service providers having access to too many things. You can do whatever it is that you want. In this case, I'm going to choose this third option, copy paste, right? So I just went ahead, um, maybe in that spreadsheet copied, you know, cell A1 down to, you know, C, whatever it was, 25, um, and just pasted it right here into the field. You can see these are basically tab del delimited, which basically means there's sort of like a big blank tab character separating each of these fields within the record. And that's fine. You don't have to mess around with it here. You just sort of put it in there. Check off the little box that says, you know, I understand that my billing, uh, that I might get charged if I'm increasing the size of, of my list. And what that basically means is MailChimp gives you their free account for up to 2,000 email addresses. And that's pretty damn good, right? For the small business owner who's starting off and they haven't done this before, I doubt you have 2,000 email addresses already. Um, but and if you did, that would be a good problem to have. So you know, you're going to start off here putting in however many you have, check off the box because it requires, and you click continue to match. The next thing is they'll just say, okay, well, let's match up the fields with um, what they use in their database. So, you know, here for email address, they're just basically, you know, I had provided in my spreadsheet that there was a field in column eight, it was called email address. In MailChimp, it's called email address. You know, I just click to confirm. Then it goes to first name, you know, I called it first name, MailChimp calls it first name, great. I click and it confirms, then it goes last name and last name confirms. And then once you've sort of confirmed all those things, you click to organize and then basically it will have uploaded into the account. It might have gone and given you a suggestion saying, uh, you know, we were able to import 99 out of 100. And you, you know, you can sort of see the one that was rejected to try to figure out why. Oftentimes it's silly things like maybe there's a blank space or there was an uh, incorrect character or like a comma or something stuck in there. So you can figure it out and, and figure out how to get that last remaining one in there. But then your address list is important. Fantastic. And if you want to do that again in the future, you can always come back and do it again. Repeat the same process. So let's go ahead and actually go into the real tool. So this is a, a for all our purposes today, you know, I'm just using a dummy account. Um, I'm going to go, now that I've already imported my audience, I'm going to go and create a campaign for the first time. So I clicked create campaign. It's going to give me some choices. What type of campaign do I want to do? Don't worry about all this other stuff. We're just building an email campaign. We want to give it a name. Um, call it anything you want. There's no wrong answer. I just tend to be very meticulous. So, you know, I usually put like a uh, year, month, and date in front of everything I do just because uh, it helps me to organize stuff. You can do whatever you want. Um, I don't know. I'll just call it my first campaign. But ideally, it should be, you know, descriptive and meaningful to you. And it's only going to be seen by you. It doesn't matter what you call this thing. So now you can see here, great, it's, it's given us sort of a blank template, but it's asking us progressively to fill some information in. Who are you sending it to? Well, recipients, right? So if I click on this, I'm going to get a list of all the different types of audience members that I have in here. So I would go and click on Add Recipients, choose the, the appropriate one, hit Save, and then I would move on to the next step. Who is it coming from? 
Okay, well, who's it coming from? In this case, I'm gonna send it from me. So maybe I'm assuming that everybody in the list knows me, or I could call it my business. Doesn't matter, personal name, business name, whatever you think is appropriate. But I'm gonna just stick uh, with this for now. And click Save. Next option, subject. So I have to give this something. Well, I'm going to call this, and I'm just going to make it easy on myself here. I'm going to grab some text I already wrote out ahead of time. So I'm going to call it, uh, did you hear about this tip to get people to open your email? Again, you could do whatever you want. It doesn't matter. What's nice is as you're topping, you typing, you begin to see like a character count because the ideal thing is you want to keep your subject lines short um, because if you big, write a lot of words, a lot of characters, things eventually get truncated, especially if you're looking at it on a small screen. Or So, you know, keeping it shorter is usually good. And then you also see sort of contextual help that MailChimp throws up along the way, giving you some suggestions of things you can do too. It's up to you to do whatever you want here. Um, next thing they might say is some optional preview text. You don't have to use this, but what happens is some email inboxes will go and maybe show like another line directly under the subject line. And it's just an opportunity for you to try to be a little bit more persuasive to get somebody to open that email. Because you know what? People who receive emails where the subject line is like email newsletter number 23, that is boring. Nobody cares. But if you have a subject line that's actually really interesting, that's compelling you to open it up, then yeah, they'll probably click and open it, right? And if you have a little bit extra preview text that might appear, then maybe that'll give people the extra incentive too. So rather than having to cram a lot into the subject line, if you, if you offload a little bit of that message into the preview, then it can also help you there. Click Save. So now I've taken care of three steps there. Next step is the content of this thing. So to design the email. Let's go ahead and design. What we're going to see is some choices here of templates that you can choose from. So again, MailChimp makes this easy because um, they realize, you know, people don't want to have to code. Um, you're going to just sort of pick something. And the chances, the you know, reality is you're probably just going to reuse it over and over again. Um, that ideally is the better thing that I would recommend. Just build something, make it have your look and feel and consistent and just repeat it every time you build a new email or send a new email campaign out, you're just duplicating the old one, and then um, you know customizing it for whatever the current message is. Um, in all these different options for different columns and, and number of columns and things, I mean, truthfully, I think it's smarter to just sort of keep things simple. One single column is probably the best thing because that way it can be viewed easily in a smartphone. I like to just sort of stick to single column because that's the most you know universally compatible um, and it'll just make it easier. And if you think about like how social media behaves this day, whether it's LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, everything's like a single column, so it makes sense. Um, so if I click on that, now I get a template and it's asking me to begin to fill stuff in here. Oops. So what do I have to do? One of the suggestions is here, throw a business logo in. You could do that, or you could go and put an image in, doesn't matter. Um, here, there's a little bit of a subhead and some body text and some hyperlinks. You know, you can do, again, whatever you want. Uh, maybe I won't include the logo this time. Maybe I'll just start off with an image. So over here on the right-hand side, I have all these blocks, which help me to sort of set, uh, you know, design this thing with a sort of drag-and-drop type interface. And then I can go and pick and choose things. So let's say I'm going to upload an image for this. I'm going to choose something uh, that I haven't used before. Let me grab this. So dragging and dropping this image of a rocket ship here. I'm going to see if you have a little checkbox there. You click insert. Now it's appearing right here in this area. Um, I could give it some alternate text. So alternate text usually means that if this is delivered on the, on the recipient's end and the recipient isn't displaying images for some reason, you have some words that appear there to explain what that image is. So maybe I'll just say, you know, rocket, rocket ship or, or time to make your email, blast off, whatever. Usually alternate text is mean to be descriptive of what it is, but you know you can choose anything you want. This block, you can go and adjust styles a little bit. Like here, this will actually allow us to sort of round the corners off a little bit. So maybe we'd do something graceful like that. Um, maybe we can make this bump out a little bit wider. And then at the very bottom, there's a save and close. So now I've sort of adjusted this image very easily didn't have to do much to manipulate it. 
Uh, let's go ahead and edit the sub subhead and the body text. So again, I've prepared something in advance. Let me just sort of copy that out. Uh, let's see. RSP VP for the Little Rocket Man webinar. Um, I'm going to throw some paragraphs of text in there. And then, you know, I can go ahead and change these hyperlinks to whatever I want. So, you know, if you're familiar with Word or Google Docs, I mean, you already know how to highlight some text and then, you know, click B for bold. If you want to make something italic, you can usually, again, highlight it, click I for italic. You can create a list if you want, a bullet list or a numbered list. Um, so, you know, if you want to make bullets in there, very easy. Just sort of use this what you see is what you get type of editor to make these adjustments. And then always remember, click save and close at the bottom. So now I got something that's coming together. It looks a little nice. Um, you know, maybe if I want to uh, put a little space here, because this looks this headline looks a little close to the image, I can stick this thing called a divider in and then just define what the, the divider looks like. So right now it looks just like a, a little line. Sorry, if you see that right there, there's like a little gray line running across. But, you know, I can change that. I can go and just say, let's make this thing look uh, like nothing, make it look white. <laughs> and maybe I want to go and increase the spacing a little bit more. So I'll just increase the PX's pixels. So it's just basically saying, okay, I want 40 pixels of space above and below where that horizontal line used to appear. So now it looks a little bit nicer, a little bit cleaner. I, I feel good about it. Let's have a call to action. So a call to action is something to click through to our website. And, you know, we're going to probably put something in there, like maybe I'll say, uh, thank you. Com. So I put an address in there, um, change the text. What is this text? It's going to uh, RSVP for this important webinar. Uh, again, whatever you want. And now we have a button. It's going to be clickable. It's going to take a person to the address we made. Um, if I wanted to change the color of that, I can sit here and like you know click on that block and adjust the the colors very easily. Um, adjust how the roundness of the corners. You know this is all stuff you can play with and experiment. And look at that. In just a few moments, we've actually put together a really nice looking email. Um, a little bit further down the page, you know, if you want to go and put your social media profiles links to those things in there, then I think that's, you know, worth doing, or you can delete the ones that are inappropriate or that you don't have presence for, or delete them all together. It's up to you. And at the very bottom, you see something that's basically all the placeholder stuff that MailChimp requires to put in there, so you try to be compliant with the spirit of the Can Spam Act. Um, so, you know, it's going to put some information in there pre-populated intentionally. Um, and, you know, when this is, you know, what this looks a little bit gibberish because there's basically placeholder um, code that's going to go and dynamically insert real data in there when it's sent and delivered. And you'll see that when you send a preview email to yourself. So on that topic, let's see what this thing is going to look like. It's right up here in preview. It says enter preview mode. And this is going to give me a sense of what does this look like on the recipient's desktop. You know, the email that we talked about, you know, the image, the headline text, the, the hyperlink. Um, over here on the right, it's showing me what this might look like. Um, you know, who's it from? What was the subject? What was the preview text? Okay, look, that looks great. Let me see what that looks like on mobile. So here on a mobile version, it's showing you what it might look like on a smartphone. And again, like if we do single column type templates, things will look a lot better. When there are two columns, then you have things that are adjusting and nudging, and sometimes they don't look quite as great. But this looks pretty good so far. So uh, I'm going to say, okay, that's good. And then if you want to send an email to yourself, there's an option here that says send test email. You click on the link, put in one or many email addresses for yourself that you want to send it to. And you go and you check those accounts to make sure everything looks good. And let's just say that everything looks good. Let's go and, uh, oops, let's click continue. So this basically dumps us back out to um, the screen we started on when we were filling in. Um, it made a plain text version of the email. Basically, you know, emails, you have plain text, which has no image, no markup code, and then you have um, the marked up versions, which is what we were just doing with that drag and drop editor. So you have to just be mindful that if you make more changes in the future to this design, you might get a prompt here that says, you know, the plain text version 
isn't up to date with, you know, the version you've been editing, you might want to go in there and, and make some quick changes. And it basically just looks like this. So you just go in there and in case anybody is receiving emails that is stripping out all the formatting and stuff, they'll just see something that's, you know, very basic text. Some other stuff down here you may or may not consider using. It's like, this is up to you. But, you know, if you want to go and tie a Google Analytics account that you use for your website, you know, that's one of the integrations you can do with MailChimp to make sure that this is passing data um, more accurately into your Google Analytics account. Um, you can go and edit this section to enable things, disable things. Just keep in mind that, you know, you don't need to use everything, but I think it's a good idea to track email opens and track email clicks um, because, you know, if somebody opens your, e you know, we're tracking that we're sending an email, it's getting delivered, so we know that. Somebody opens the email, we know that. Somebody clicks on a link in that email, we know that. Those are the measurements that are going to sort of help you figure out was this successful and what can I do to improve it, right? If you were just sending mass email from your regular inbox, like if you're using Gmail or whatever it is, and just sending emails a hundred time, uh, you know, a hundred per or in bulk, 100, 100, 100, whatever from your regular inbox, you know, you know there's some limitations that you're not allowed to send more than a certain amount on a day, and you have no statistics at all about what was delivered, what was opened, what was clicked. So that's, you know, good, clear benefit here. So let's say we're done with everything, and, you know, or if you wanted to come back later on, you can always sort of, you know, finish, come back to your campaign at a later time. This is still in draft mode. You can see that right here. It says draft. So if I want to go back and edit it again to finish it, so just go ahead and do whatever it is. Like in this case, it probably says add, add an audience. Um, let's see. I'm just going to add an audience. I'm going to click save. And then it says uh, you're ready to send. So I can either send it immediately right now, or I can schedule it for the future. And if I schedule it for the future, then I can pick a date, like if I want this to go out Wednesday at 12, or whatever it is. I can define what that is, and then click Schedule, and then it'll be all queued up and ready to go at that time. So it's completely up to you. Send immediately or send in the future. And that's it. That was very simple, very easy, and very repeatable. So let me just take this back to the screen for a second. Um, just a reminder, if you have questions, submit them in the chat, and we'll get to them in a moment. Uh, so after this, there's obviously a lot of other things you can do, but, you know, as you do this over and over again, you're going to get practice. You're going to get more comfortable, more skilled at it. You'll experiment with it. If you're not sure how to do something, there is a very robust help section for MailChimp, or you just go to Google and type something specific, whatever your question is. Probably it's been answered a thousand times before, and you'll find an easy answer. Um, something important, you know, at the beginning of creating your account, they will have some authentication or domain verification steps they'll probably walk you through. So it's always a good idea to follow whatever MailChimp is recommending you do. And that's really about how, trying to help ensure that your message is going to get delivered. Um, I mentioned before, you can go and integrate Google Analytics if you so choose. It, you don't have to. It's just an option for, you know, to do it if you feel like you want to do it. Personalization is pretty cool because, you know, you can go and insert a person's name in a subject line. You can insert a person's name in the body text. Um, so you can learn how to do that. But of course, you want to be careful. And then list segmentation. So, you know, if you're if you're managing two lists, one who are like prospects and one who are customers, because you want to send slightly different messages out to each, then, you know, you want to learn about how to do that for the future. So just to recap what you learned today, you learned how to create an account at MailChimp.com. You learned about putting an email list together, how to go and, s and create your first campaign, select the template, populate it with an image, headline, things like that. Test, learn, repeat. Um, of course, you know, if you're not comfortable doing this stuff by yourself, you can always go and hire an intern or some marketing professional locally. You know, there's many places, you know, local chamber of commerce, your business networking. Um, go ahead and find somebody on an online marketplace if you don't want to do it yourself um, or if you want to delegate that out. Um, I'm going to take questions in a second. If you would like a copy of this recording, just go and visit thankyoufeedback.com. Put in the information. Just give me a little bit of feedback so we know what you liked and what your recommendations are for the future. And then a few days from now, we'll send the link out to everybody who has responded to this. Uh, so questions. I uh, see there's a bunch in the chat. I'm going to actually try to scroll back up through the history and pick them up here. Let me see. Um, 
someone here wrote a question, how do you generate an email list? Uh, how do you generate an email? When you first start a company project, do you send friends and family an email, a share on your Facebook uh, to try to generate a proper email list? Or is there some other methodology to this? Like the emails are going to come from whatever. It's going to come from your address book. It's come from your LinkedIn profile. If you had some kind of opt-in field on your website, you have to decide where those things come from. The thing I mentioned before about trying to stay within the spirit of the law, the Can't Spam Act, is somebody should have reached out to you and requested information, or you already had some kind of existing transactional relationship. Um, and that's usually the best place to start to prevent hard feelings. Uh, <laughs> and remember, people can always unsubscribe if they don't like what you're sending them. But I would just say try to keep it within known relationships is usually a better way to do things. Uh, thank you. How do you protect image copyrights? Um, I am not a copyright expert, so I cannot go and tell you how to do that. I mean, if you put it in, in your own unique image on your website, I mean, somebody can steal it. There's no way of preventing that. Google is going to crawl your pages of your website, find an image, throw it in their image directory. Um, somebody can easily screenshot things. They can right-click, save as from your email or from your website or your social media. There is very little prevention. If you don't want something to be found online, don't put it online. That's the only true <laughs> copyright prevention in a digital age. Um, so sorry, I don't have a better answer. But thank you for that question, Brenda. Uh, okay, first part here. Can you let us know if images or videos get more clicks? Um, think about how social media has become so predominant in our behaviors, right? If we see a nice image coming up the screen and maybe some compelling text or provocative text, we're going to click on it, right? So that's up to you to figure out what is the appropriate thing. And it's up to you to test if email, I'm sorry, if a video or images are getting more clicks. Here's the thing, though. It's like I don't try to embed video in the body of an email. I might go and embed a screenshot of something, encourage somebody to click on it, and then that click is taking them to a page of my website that I control. So there's more messaging and text and a call to action around that video on a page that I control. So that's my recommendation to you is, you know, choose emails, images that are compelling, not boring, stock art if you can. Use ones that you have permission to use. And actually, you know, one of the things I, I said before is there are sources out there. Like one of them is called unsplash.com. Um, I mean, me as a, as a marketing professional, I purchase everything. <laughs> I have a history of documenting everything. But for you, if you're just trying to get started and you want to use something that's free, I mean, this is a source that actually allows you to use their images on your behalf for free. And they're usually can be used for personal or for commercial. Um, but you always want to sort of read the disclaimer statements and everything. So in case, you know, in, in this case, I clicked on this one for Rocket. I found this image by a gentleman named John Baker. You know, it says download for free. Okay, download an image. And then when you start downloading, it sort of gives you some, some also some, some suggestions here of like, uh, you know, share a citation, which is basically a link back to this uh, person so that, you know, people know where you found this image. Um, if I would use a site like Unsplash, you know, maybe I'll take an extra step of putting a little watermark text in here saying, you know, photo by John Baker via Unsplash or something. But that's just me because I, as a marketing professional trying to protect my clients and stuff, I go in above and beyond. You know, what you decide to do is obviously up to you. But uh, good questions. The sec part two of that one from Marin said, given how everyone gets so many emails, how many do you suggest sending a month? Um, it's going to be very different for every business. And that's the problem, right? Because, you know, is your business relevant to be sending messages on a regular basis? I mean, maybe if you're running sales continuously on different things. Um, but for the average service provider, you probably don't need to be sending a message more than once a month. Um, or maybe some people will choose once every three months just because there's challenges of incorporating this into your work style, right? Um, you have to decide what's going to make sense for you. You're going to have to test different things. You're going to have to test sending on different days of the week, um, different times of, of the day, see which ones get more open, which get reactions. You know, your subject lines are going to be crucial because that's what's usually going to compel somebody to allow you to open it, to, to open it or not. I mean, you know, I joke often that like my favorite email that I get every week is from Weber, the, the the barbecue grilling company because it's usually like Friday sometime between 3 and 5 p.m. I know I can always check my inbox. The message from Weber is there. It's got some new recipe I've never heard of before to go and, you know, fry something or beer can chicken or do something weird with a barbecue grill that I've never 
thought to do before. Um, and reality is I don't ever do most of those things, <laughs> but I actually enjoy reading it. And it's the thing I come to expect. And if it isn't there by like five o'clock on a Friday every week, I'm wondering, well, where the hell is that email? So it's like, you know, they've trained me over many years to come and expect something. And that's what you hopefully would like to do, right? So thanks for the question there. Um, Lynn asks, for unsubscribe, does MailChimp handle that automatically and update your list or provide you with an unsubscribe list to bump up against yours? How does that work? Yeah, excellent question. Um, since you're up, uploading all your email addresses or whatever into their audience, and then they're sort of dynamically managing or automatically managing that for you. And if somebody uses the unsubscribe functions when they received an email, if they click the unsubscribe button, whatever, yeah, it's flagging it in the system. This has unsubscribed. And the next time you try to send a message, it'll be sending to, you know, everyone except that person or persons that unsubscribe. So it's managing that, but it's also providing the information to you. If you go into your reporting, you'll find that. So you'll discover why did somebody unsubscribe. So like I see that often like with, with healthcare medical provider practices that I work with, you know, so we're maintaining, maintaining two lists. They're maintaining a list of their in their practice management and then they're exporting new names to go and put into MailChimp or Constant Contact and we're sending messages out. And then periodically we have to take all the stuff in Constant Contact or MailChimp and the, everybody who uns, requested to unsubscribe from marketing messages and sort of bump that back into the practice management, um, contact management system. So that way to make sure that we're respecting requests everywhere. Uh, that that's obviously a much more elaborate scenario, but for this average small business owner, this should just automatically take care of it for you. Thank you for the question, Lynn. Uh, Robert says, I am a photographer. Most photographers will welcome the opportunity to share their images on as many website email campaigns as possible. The creator of any image does own the copyright to that image, however. Uh, it is in everyone's best interest for you to contact the photographer, tell them that you love a particular image and what to use it. Uh, get permission. Ask the photographer how they would like credit to read. Create a positive relationship with photographers to ensure that, one, you are not stealing. Two, ensure that you that no one will ask you to take the images down later. And three, foster a relationship from which you may use other images in the future. Excellent, really appreciate that, Robert. Thank you for the suggestion to everyone. Mary Lou writes, thank you for the info. Thank you, appreciate that. Lynn writes, uh, can you link MailChimp to CRM systems like Salesforce? Uh, yes, um, I actually don't do that right now, but I know there is an integration. And before you commit to anything, just go through the the help section for MailChimp, you know, it's like support.mailchimp.com or something like that, and just look for what they integrate with, and I'm pretty sure you can find something. There might also be limitations, so you might want to also do a Google search to figure out if, you know, if it's a one-way push or if it's asynchronous going both ways. Uh, Beth writes, thank you so much, Roland. That was great. Hey, thank you, Beth. Uh, Natalie writes, just to confirm, MailChimp does show all recipients in the email, or is there a setting to avoid this? Does show all recipients in the email, or is it? I'm not sure I answered a question. Like, uh, is Natalie still on the line? Maybe we can unmute her and let her ask the question. Uh, I can't tell. Um, um, yeah, yeah. I, 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 uh, can you hear, can me? hear me? Yes, Natalie, yeah. go ahead. Hi, uh, thanks. Um, um, I just wanted I just to make sure, sure in the email, email the recipients that it wasn't was share. share. Oh, that's that's what, what I meant, share. 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 Oh, you mean like in the two? Like if, if you received it with everybody else on it. Yes. Right, right, right. Okay, so I sent the email, you received it, but you look and see like, oh my God, I see 500 other email addresses in there as well, right? Uh, no. Right, it, yes. it, it, it's It's hidden. So it's, it's like a blind carbon copy. You would see only you and you would not see anybody else and vice versa. Nobody else would see you. Okay, okay. you don't have to do, do a, a setting, setting for that. that. It, it automatically, automatically does, does that. that. No. No, that's 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 the nature of it, right? Because it wants okay, to sort right, of behave perfect. a little bit differently than a regular email. But that's an excellent yeah, question. Yeah. I understand. Thank, Thank you, you, Natalie. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lynn writes, how often do you recommend refreshing your list? Obviously, smaller lists are easier to refresh, but if you have bigger lists and need to schedule it, what do you recommend for timing? Well, refreshing the list, I mean, the question is, ideally, you should always be adding to your list. Hopefully, you know, as part of whatever marketing that you're doing, lead generation you're doing, you know, you're doing other things that are trying to get people to opt into your list, your social media, um, if you're doing webinars, you know, you're always filling the pipeline, right? So you're always adding the list in that sense. Um, I think, you know, the, I, I said, I used the word stale earlier, where you're allowing lists to go stale, because if you're not sending any messages out for three months, six months, nine months at a time, then, you know, 
things go inactive and you have like greater uh, uh, gr uh, greater undeliverability rates and stuff. So I think in the end, just constantly continue your marketing, getting new names always added on. And, you know, ultimately, you know, the list is going to grow. People will churn out over time because it's no longer relevant or they move away out of your service area or whatever. That can't be helped. But, you know, just continue always trying to add. Uh, let's see, if you have bigger lists and need to schedule, what do you recommend in timing? So bigger lists and scheduling. Um, that's a good question because, I mean, I used to be on a habit of sending emails around like between 12 and 1 every Wednesday and maybe 3 o'clock on a Friday. And there was some logic to that because some of the data that I was seeing consistently showed that, you know, Mondays and Tuesdays, people weren't really opening the particular emails. Fridays, you know, people are beginning to sort of have that, that largess when they're getting ready for the weekend and they're not concentrating on their work too much and they're looking at distractions and opening up email, social media, it seemed to work well. And then there's a lot of data out there, like every week, there's an, somebody puts a, a study out saying, you know, the best day and time of the week to send an email is this or that. And everything will always contradict each other. Um, and then it changes by category, you know, realtors and real estate professionals versus healthcare professionals versus financial professionals, they will see all sorts of different statistics on what the best day and time is. And, you know, and, and part of your question is like, if you have a big list, should you be splitting these things up? It's completely up to you and what you define a big list to be. But, you know, if you had tens of thousands of email addresses, rather than pushing them all out at once, you could go and stagger them, like say a thousand an hour or whatever. Um, or you could separate it into an A-B test and like half the list gets one subject line, half the list gets a different subject line, and you can compare and see um, which one was getting a better open rate and a click rate. Uh, so there's a lot of different things you can do. You just sort of have to, you know, maybe just do a little research if you want to want, or look at your, your own data and try to figure out what seemed to work better for you in the past. But excellent question, Lynn. Thank you. Robert asks, I've been in business for 25 years and would like to create an email newsletter. I have about 5,000 emails all categorized in my Apple Contacts program. I have been creating custom fields for everyone, such as Sam Home. How do I get all my emails into MailChimp with all these custom fields in place? I really could not take the time to enter 5,000 emails manually. Um, I hear you. <laughs> I know I use Apple contacts also. And I know like sometimes when you have a massive list, just organizing it is going to be a challenge. Uh, you know, I've done things in the past where I've exported my Apple contacts into Google, you know, Gmail, Gmail has a contact section. And once you get it into Google, able to export it from there as an Excel file or a .csv, comma separated value file .csv, which you can open up in Excel. And once you got that thing in Excel, delete all the extra columns that are irrelevant and sort of clean it up a little bit and figure out anything that's just bizarre. Um, but yeah, that's, <laughs> you're going to have to do some work. I mean, there's no going around it, it trying to improve the quality of your, your list. But um, it's a legitimate problem. I've tried to help people over the past with things like that. Um, but, you know, it's ultimately it's something you're going to have to just decide to either do or, or scale down, do it in phases, you know, choose some now, choose some later. Um, it's up to you. Uh, but thank you for the question, Robert. And I think the last one I have here is from Ram. Uh, how often do you send emails to the same group? Um, I think we kind of just tackled that a few moments ago where we were saying it's it's really, you know, you're going to decide what days, what times are appropriate, and then the frequency is up to you. Is there enough to be enough differentiation each time to be sending it, right? It's not like social media where you're sending, putting the same post several times a week because you're worried that like people in different time zones, you know, uh, people on the East Coast are seeing it at 9 a.m., but you maybe want to post it again like tomorrow at 12 p.m. so people on the West Coast see it at 9 a.m. Um, but it's the exact same message. You know, people do that on social media. With an email, I wouldn't necessarily do that. You're going to go and send it at whatever time makes sense, and you could go and figure that out in your time zone. But you have to decide what is the appropriate frequency and how those people are going to react to that. Um, I think that's just the best, um, you know, and really how much time do you have for generating all this content? Because it's work, you know, but thanks for the question, man. Um, so it looks like that's all the questions that we got. I really appreciate everybody who stuck it out and, uh, got through this. So just a reminder, there is no cost business counseling available. You can talk to subject matter experts like myself. Like if you wanted to go and like, uh, schedule an appointment with me on something like critique your website or look at your email campaign or your Google ads campaign. 
you can make a request through the SBDC, either at Round Valley Community College or Brookdale Community College. Just use the links on the website, uh, sbdcrvcz.com or mosbdc.com. Um, when you go to those websites, there's a counseling request link. Just pro follow the steps and then you can go and do that. It's not just with me. There are many, many different subject matter experts on many different topics. Um, it's, you know, best kept secret. <laughs> so, you know, please take advantage of it and, you know, tell a friend because these, these services unfortunately don't get advertised that well. And please, you know, do take a moment to try to help somebody else out out there because I know there's a lot of people who are who have been struggling during this time. And as I've been trying to meet with as many people as possible, um, I'm hearing a lot of s stories. You know, we all know there's a lot of, a lot of, difficult challenges, but a lot of people are beginning to shut down and not do anything. And that's the thing you want to try to keep motivating and pushing yourself for because, you know, we're a hundred days out and we're beginning to sort of get through, get, get, see some light at the end of the, of the tunnel here. So it's time to sort of restart and re-energize and try to motivate everybody around. Um, if you want a copy of this webinar recording, use uh, the link, thankyoufeedback.com. Just go there, just answer a couple of questions, providing us feedback about this webinar today. And um, we'll gladly send you the link to the webinar in a few days after we had a chance to just go through it and make sure it's edited and properly. Um, and that's it. So uh, everyone who's uh, who's sending me chat messages here, thank you, I appreciate it. Marin, Ram, uh, Brenda, Nonsters, um, thank you all for sticking with me. I hope this was all useful please go and do something with it and again you know check in and uh, check in on someone make sure you can help them if you can so take care everyone